And uh, our speaker today is Norman Anderson. Oh. I've known Norman, yes, Norman Anderson. I've known Norman probably for 25 years. He was uh, one of the fellows that all got me into the uh, Lewis and Clark Honor Guard in Great Falls. And Norman and I have probably been doing some uh, leapfrogging as being president of the Portage Drought chapter in Great Falls. Norman originally was a uh, history teacher at Great Falls High School in uh, Great Falls, Montana for many, many years. He's retired now. And Norman had the honor of being chosen as the Montana History Teacher of the Year. Isn't that great? <laughs> And Norman, as uh, in the Honor Guard and in the, uh, which is a group of historic reenactors, we tell the story through the reenactments we do in our in our encampments. And Norman portrays Captain Meriwether Lewis, and he's done it for years. He's made many many of his own clothing. Um, he's made all of a lot of a lot of his. Uh, um, display items himself. Uh, he's an expert in virtually every aspect of the expedition. He's got a memory that's unbelievable. I wish I had it. And one final thing about Norman is he's got, a, he's got the courage of a lion. When the bicentennial was on, and uh, Norman was asked, because portraying Captain Lewis, if he would help reenact when the uh, grizzly bear attacked Captain Lewis, uh, in Great Falls when he made that solo trip. So Norman said, sure, I, I guess I can do that. He talked to his wife and she said, well, I, you know, the insurance is paid up, go ahead. Uh, uh, so Norman did it and they brought the grizzly bear in, a live grizzly bear from Missoula, I mean, excuse me, from Bozeman. And the, uh, the uh, trainer of the grizzly bear said, uh, Norman, he said, you know, the, this bear needs to get to know you a little better. And Norman said, well, what exactly does that mean? He said, well, he needs to smell you. So he said, just stick your hand out, Norman. So Norman, like a good trooper, Captain Lewis would have done, he stuck his hand out, and the next thing you know, his hand was embedded in the grizzly bear's mouth about up to here, full of bear snot, all kinds of saliva. And Norman, of course, luckily, he didn't pull his hand back out very quickly, so... Norman had that experience of doing that with a real live grizzly bear, so I hope you give a good welcome to Mr. Grizzly, Norman Anderson. Thank you. Uh, a quick disclaimer, I'm gonna probably run long. Uh, brevity being the soul of wit, I'm a thoroughly humorous person. And so uh, what I wanna talk to you about today is what I think is a kind of underexplored and underappreciated aspect of the Lewis and Clark expedition. And that is the return trip of 1806. And trying to come up with a title, I've called it Exploring the Unanswered. Because I think when we get out to Fort Clatsop, the captains actually have a lot of questions left to look at. And uh, this is a section that hasn't been considered much, I think, by most of the people who've written. If you look at the literature, usually at least two-thirds of the book is about the outward bound trip. And on the return trip, it's, they went home. And oh, by the way, there was a gunfight up on the Two Medicine and Lewis got shot in the posterior when he went hunting with the blind guy. And so I think that we've left out some things that need to be uh, considered, and I'd like to throw those ideas out to you today. So to start at the beginning really quickly, um, I've got to be able to manipulate my screen here. This is going to be my challenge. Thomas Jefferson's instructions of 1806, uh, just a snippet here, and what they say, he goes on for several pages, as you know. What I'd like you to consider are what I've highlighted in red. When you come back, if you're on the same route, you can examine the plants and the animals at a different time of the year. 
Uh, obviously, that's a smart thing to do. The climate, the weather, all those things are really valuable. But I think what's maybe most significant is right up at the top. Your task is to find the most direct and practicable water communication across this continent. And when you get out to Fort Clatsop and think about it, as the captains did, have they answered that question? And I would argue, based on what they've learned, the answer is no. Uh, we know that they followed the instructions. They went up the Missouri all the way to its source. They went up the Jefferson. Is there a better water route? And they have evidence of two possibilities, at least already, uh, ready to look at. They struggled to cross the Continental Divide. Is there a better way across the Continental Divide? Would it be better to go overland from the Great Falls all the way to the Clearwater and, and skip that whole Jefferson Lake? And we can go through each of these steps. What about the Yellowstone? If you've seen the confluence, the Missouri and the Yellowstone are pretty much equal. And so could the Yellowstone be the better river instead, as it turns out? Are there more plants? Uh, are there more animals? Are there better samples? And maybe most important, are there ways we can kind of introduce more native people to Jeffersonian America and maybe combine those things together? So if you look at that, say, that's really a pretty ambitious series of questions that need to be examined on the way back. So how do you go about doing this? And the first thing to consider is there's only one way you can do this. You have to split your men into separate divisions. There's no other way. And they often get criticized in the uh, literature for doing this. I will argue that it's not nearly as foolhardy as it might, have, it might seem today. Uh, tw hindsight being 2020, the captains didn't have that benefit. Lewis planned this trip originally to be about 15 men. And if they split, each of the captains will have about 15 men. So that's legitimate. Uh, what about the Native Americans out there? Could there be a problem? Well, we know there was, but in truth, from April 11th of 1805 until August 11th of 1805, four entire months, which covers almost the entire span of Montana, Lewis and Clark never saw another living soul. So from their perspective, splitting up to cross Montana is not particularly threatening. And you say, well, it, they were wrong, but based on their previous knowledge, it's a pretty good assessment. And something has to happen. We need to chart the Yellowstone. Well, give that to the map maker. Someone needs to follow the road to the buffalo. Captain can do that. What about the canoes? Well, the top sergeant can take those canoes and convey them back up to the Great Falls and across the portage. While Mr. O or Sergeant Ordway is doing that, what about going up and examining the northern reaches? How far up does Louisiana extend? Nobody knows. What about the horses? The most valuable thing they have left in terms of trade goods at this point is their horse herd of 67 horses. Well, we're going to give that to Sergeant Pryor, and he and his men can drive those animals all the way to the Mandan villages. And then, oh, he can just take a little 200-mile side trip up to find Hugh Haney and see if he can't negotiate for some Sioux leaders to join the expedition on the return. And for this to work, this is, going to, this is a lot of moving parts, and it means that everybody has to do their job, not just the captains, not just the sergeants, everybody. Uh, this is the kind of thing you might expect of a modern SEAL team. And so, right up front, I'm going to say this is not a mad dash to get home, at least not until the last part. This is really a return exploration. So that's my thesis. So on June 30th, when they arrive at Traveler's Rest, what have they accomplished? And if you look at the numbers here, it doesn't look all that impressive. 
They've been on the road 100 days. They've made 689 miles, more or less, less than seven miles a day. Uh, not terribly impressive, but if we continue on, they have acquired more horses. They've established a sound relationship with the Nez Perce Nation. They know more about crossing the mountains uh, than most anybody else in the continent and how difficult it is to do. Only the native people can tell them how foolish everything was when they tried to cross when the snow was still eight feet deep and so on. Uh, they've collected 86 plants already to add to the herbarium. And I think significantly, and underappreciated again, is even though they've only gone less than 700 miles, they've actually completed all the uphill portion of the return trip except for the last two or three days because they're very, very short of the Continental Divide. And once you're back on water, it's a downhill slide all the way into St. Louis. So what I want to do is kind of visually show you how this plays out, and I'll try to keep the commentary to a minimum or I'll never get done on time, so here we go. Uh, June 30th, uh, we'll start on this day simply because tomorrow's June 30th and we're at Traveler's Rest. Uh, and on this day, they're camped at what at a hot springs we call today Lolo Hot Springs. The captains have bathed in the springs and they're ready to go. So on the 30th, they will take off. It's about a 25 mile hike down Lolo Creek into Traveler's Rest. Uh, they hunt along the way, expecting it's going to be difficult to find game for Clark, especially as he goes up the Bitter Root. And they return, planning to stay a couple days at Traveler's Rest. Oops, and now I made a mistake already. Uh, try again. So, what do you do? You got to rest those horses up, let them graze a little bit. John Shields has some guns to uh, repair. And on this day, Meriwether Lewis wanders around and finds five new plants in one day, right around here. Uh, most significantly for Montanans at least, he comes up with the bitter root, and that's where he gains his sample. So even while they're resting, he's busy working. The captains also pretty much finalize their rosters. By the second that information is out, and we can see what the divisions were. Lewis is going to take nine men. He's going to leave three at the portage. He's going to take 17 horses. Clark takes everybody else, but his group is also subdivided. He will take some and go on the Yellowstone. Ordway will take nine men and, drag the, and take the canoes back to the Great Falls. Prior and two men will take those horses over to the Mandan villages and beyond. If you know the story, you recognize that's not exactly the way it turned out. It got changed along the way because that's flexible thinking. As situations arrive, uh, arose, they simply changed what they set out to do. And so with that in place, on July 3rd, they take off. And so the first legs are kind of entertaining, I guess. For Clark, it's going to be three days going up the Bitter Root. He stays on the west side of that river, and his biggest problem is going to be all of the side streams bringing down all the snow belt late in the year. So he has a tough time crossing stream after stream after stream. Uh, Lewis gets that problem taken care of right off the bat because he has to Clark pass Clark's River, and because he has the navigation instruments, he needs to keep them safe, so he builds three rafts. He floats them across the river. It takes six hours. By the end of the day, the rafts are falling apart. Lewis falls in the river. He gets his watch wet. The native men swam their horses across the river and sat on the banks and watched these guys for six hours, wondering what in the devil they were doing. So it's, it's not a great start for Lewis, but there indeed it is. Uh, on the 4th, Clark continues south, more trouble with the rivers. Lewis works his way across what today is Missoula, Montana. Uh, doesn't leave until noon because he wants to 
get some deer to send the native companions on their way to the west. And eventually he works his way along the north shore of Clark's River and gets to what today we call the Blackfoot, the Coquille Riscuit, uh, the road to the buffalo, and he makes his way several miles up there, and as well, he picks up another flower. Uh, July 5th, Clark has a short day, but at the end of the day, he's camped below the Continental Divide and is in a great situation for moving forward. Lewis has a long day on this day. He crosses the Clearwater River, Montana's Clearwater River, and finally camps at what he calls Seaman's Creek. Uh, would be right about in here is where Seaman's Creek flows in to the river. He also picks up another flower. The sixth, Clark sails over what today we call Gibbon Pass on a nice, gradual, native road. He's quite impressed with it. This is a huge improvement on 18.5 in terms of crossing the divide. And when he gets up on top, he can actually see the gap where he needs to go to get back to Camp Fortunate. For Lewis, he crosses what he calls the Prairie of the Knobs. Uh, some of you will get a chance to see the Prairie of the Knobs tomorrow uh, on one of the field trips. And Towards the end of the day, he climbs over some mountains and camps on the western edge of another little prairie. And along the way, he collects five more plowers. July 7th, a really interesting day. For Clark, he wakes up in the morning and finds that nine horses are missing. The men can't find him. So he simply says to Ordway, take some guys, take four guys, and go find those horses. I'm leaving. And he does. And so he will continue about 30 miles, passing through another hot spring area, which we call Jackson Hot Spring today, where he will stop and cook his meat in 25 minutes. Ordway spends the entire day chasing horses almost all the way to the Continental Divide and then herding them back to camp. He doesn't move at all, so now he's 30 miles behind Clark. For Lewis, he will cross that prairie, come to a fork to the north. He takes that following the Indian Road crosses over a saddle, takes another small creek, and goes over what we call Lewis and Clark Pass, perhaps misnamed since Clark was several hundred miles away at this point. Uh, this is what the pass looks like today. This is, this is actually the pass here, and this is pretty much the trail that Lewis would have taken. What's interesting about Lewis and Clark Pass is that when you get up on top, you can see what Lewis called Fort Mountain, modern Square Butte today. This is about what it looks like as an image I took a few years ago. Lewis looks out and he can see that butte and he says, it's only about 20 miles away. It's 37. Uh, they had clear air back then. But nonetheless, if he's heading back to the Great Falls in a hurry, which way does he go? He's going to aim right straight towards the butte because that's an easy two-day ride back to the upper portage camp. If he wants to go to the Missouri, he angles off to the, towards the south, but as you can see, Lewis takes off primarily to the north, going an entirely different direction. He's going to examine the Medicine River, he's going to see if it's navigable and work on what its course actually looks like, and oh, by the way, he takes the time to collect four new plants. July 8th, Clark makes it all the way back to Camp Fortunate this day. Ordway 
has what I consider a really impressive day. He drives the horses 46 miles, uh, which is some serious work. Uh, he, pardon me? Okay, I'm sorry. Uh, he drives the horses 46 miles. Uh, they don't stop to hunt. They find some meat that was left at the hot springs, and late in the day they find an antelope head that had been abandoned by Clark's men, and that becomes their supper. Uh, charming, huh? And, and he camps on Willard's Creek, which is actually today about a mile or two west of Montana's first territorial capital of Bannock. Uh, Clark, meanwhile, gets back to the camp, fishes the canoes out of the river where they've been cached to let them dry out, opens up the caches, finds that much of their scientific material has been destroyed, and begins to prepare for the next phase of the trip. For Lewis, an interesting day this day for him. To his northwest is a mountain we call Haystack Butte. He called it Shishiqua Mountain. Uh, it actually is shown on Aerosmith's map made before Lewis ever left Washington. He knew about this mountain, which is kind of amazing. Uh, he heads towards it, and then following the Indian advice, he will curve away, pick up what we call Elk Creek right over here, and continue down to the Medicine River. Uh, he crosses what he called the Torrent River. It's actually the Dearborn. He didn't recognize it as such. Just about at this location right here. Uh, that's part of the Old North Trail. And ends up camping on the Medicine River. A good day. And he picks up another new plant, the needle and thread grass. July 9th. Ordway shows up by 10 o'clock. Uh, the men divvy up a couple feet of tobacco apiece. They get everything prepared for their departure the following day. Lewis has a tough day. He only makes nine miles because it's raining cats and dogs, and he stops in an abandoned Indian lodge, but he picks up on this day uh, the blue flax, and the blue flax he wrote about fairly extensively and enthusiastically in 1805, and certainly he collected this plant. But this is a little bit of redundancy going on here because no samples remain from 1805. So he's not only collecting plants, from, he's not collecting only new plants, he's also doubling up on the plants that he's had to make sure he has a good specimen. On the 9th, Lewis continues 23 miles along the Medicine River, slowed up by the mud from the previous rain. Clark, a really remarkable day. He takes the horses, Ordway gets the canoes. And in the Beaverhead River, or the Jefferson as they called it, is a nasty, windy little river at this point. It's very narrow, and these are long canoes, and it's a tough place. Uh, to work. But by midday, Ordway's kept up with Clark pretty well. And so when they stop for lunch, Clark switches over and says, I'll get in the canoes with you, get off the horse, and I'll put as much baggage as I can in the canoes. We'll make, we'll make the horses work less. By the end of the day, the horses have made about 31 or 32 miles. Ordway and Clark on the water together have made about 40 seven miles, Ordway said he thought it was 94. <laughs> That's how hard he thought he was working. Uh, and interestingly, as you can see these little kind of sideways diamonds on the trail here, he passes five of his campsites from 185 and camps opposite the sixth, which tells you how much faster they're moving already than they were the previous year. They will camp near Beaverhead Rock. The 11th, Lewis is back on the Missouri River. He sets up a camp opposite the Upper Portage Camp. He has gas go along the river to hunt. They find a lot of buffalo. He has several buffalo killed and immediately has his men making bull boats so he can transport his instruments across the river. For Clark, he and, Ordway, he and Pryor will make 
close to 40 miles apiece. Pryor does a little bit better in his camp several miles ahead of him. But again, pretty solid progress made on the river. And if you've floated the river, I think you recognize if a 40 mile day, you're moving along pretty well, especially in a narrow river like this. On the 12th, not so good. For Clark, uh, he will stay in the canoes and his canoe gets caught in a snag and they have to rescue him from it. Uh, he's completely hung up by the snag, but that's not so bad. For Lewis, it's worse. Uh, I mentioned horses part one before. Now we have horses part two. A subplot of this whole thing is horses. Uh, they are continually a problem. When Lewis wakes up in the morning, his 17 horses have miraculously transformed themselves into seven. And his plans are pretty seriously endangered. He sends gas out along the river, the Medicine River, to look for horses. He sends Werner, Werner out in the prairie. Between the two of them, they come back with three. So he sends out the A-team. George Drouillard and Joseph Field take off. And by the end of the day, Joseph Field comes back with nothing. George Drouillard doesn't come back at all. He is apparently on the trail. At the same time, Lewis completes the bull boats and floats himself across the river to the east side. The 13th, by midday, Ordway, Pryor, and Clark have reached the Three Forks. They will drive the horses across the Missouri River and across the Gallatin for the North Shore. They will reallocate the baggage into the canoes and the horses, and without a whole lot of to do, the two parties part. We don't know how far Ordway goes this day because he's not very good about telling us that stuff in the journals. Lewis, uh, Clark makes about six more miles, Ordway maybe seven or eight held up by headwinds, but at least the separation has occurred and they're on their two separate legs by this point. For Clark, or for Lewis, he will move himself to the upper portage camp. We don't know exactly with Drewyard, but he apparently traces the trail left by the horses and the people who are helping them move to a different location uh, all the way to Lewis's trail of the several days before. And when he realizes he's at the foot of the, of the pass and the horses and the Indians are long gone, he turns around and comes back. We don't know how far he goes. He's going to camp along some water for sure, possibly right in here on the Dearborn River. But it's over a 50-mile day for Drouillard's horse. Uh, and obviously, he's failed. The 14th, Clark will work himself across the Gallatin Valley. It's swampy and difficult work but by the end of the day, he's camped below the pass that Sacagawea has pointed out to him. Ordway has gone a good considerable distance to the north and is well on his way. For Lewis, he's now waiting for Drouillard to come back. And based on when Drouillard arrives the following day, I think maybe Drouillard got about as far as somewhere near Square Butte. This is all speculation on my part because there's nothing in the journals to lay this out but there's actually a fairly decent trail that follows that course there. So Lewis waits for him, uh, held up. The 15th, for Clark, he's over the pass, he finds the Yellowstone River, no trees to build canoes, so he moves along the North Shore several miles, passes a stream that he names for John Shields, and then camps some ways below it. For Lewis, a bad day twice. He sends out Hugh McNeil to go find and the, check the condition of the white pirogue. McNeil gets as far as Willow Run, that kind of wave station in the middle. And at this point, he runs into a grizzly bear. He's bucked off his horse. He breaks his musket over the bear's head and then scrambles up to the top of a tree and waits for the bear to lose interest, which takes him several hours. When the bear finally leaves, 
he has to go back and chase his horse two or three miles to find it before he can ride back to camp. Uh, for Lewis, it's worse because when George Drouillard returns to camp finally, he comes back without any horses. So now the tally is Lewis has lost seven out of his 17 horses. Drouillard's horse has just put in a small 120 mile ride. Gas, Werner, and Frazier can no longer go north with Lewis, which changes that dynamic dramatically. Lewis is going to take off with two spare horses to carry his baggage and his instruments. The men at the portage will have no spare horses. They'll be left with four to help them complete the portage. And oh, on this day, this is the last mention of Seaman in the journals. He spent the night howling from the torture of the mosquitoes. The 16th, Clark continues on that no sh shore. He doesn't get very far. George Shannon kills a buffalo and they spend a bunch of time building moccasins for the horses because their feet are so sore from the gravelly soil. By this point, uh, Ordway has made it through the first range of mountains and he's camped next to Ordway's Creek, which he's proud to say is named after him. And for Lewis, oh, I'm, I'm good. I got ahead of myself again, sorry. Uh, Lewis will make it up to the falls. He stops to make sketches of the two largest waterfalls and camps below the Great Chute. Okay, on the 17th, it's now Ordway will get to what they call Tower Rock. Uh, Lewis climbed that in 1805. He stops there and has Coulter and Collins go out and shoot some bighorn sheep as specimens that the captains want to achieve. Now from this point on, when you see a picture of bighorn sheep, it just means the captains killed some more. Uh, the entire bighorn population of Montana is fairly seriously decimated by the time that the captains are done trying to get these good specimens. And what's cool about this picture is I took this about three weeks ago at Tower Rock. Uh, the bighorn sheep were common there then, and they're still pretty easy to see there even today. Uh, Lewis makes it all the way up to the Tansy River and collects another flower. The 18th, Lewis will make it to the mouth, or make it to the Marias River. Patrick Gass will take the horses and three men, and they will go out and examine the white pirogue, and it's their day, this is their day to acquire some of that tobacco that's been so carefully cached. Uh, so they come back with that. For Clark, a bad day. Charbonneau's chasing a buffalo and falls off his horse. He's banged up. Worse yet, Gibson's horse skitters when he's trying to get back on it, and he falls back and impales his leg on a burned tree stump and is pretty badly damaged. The 19th, Lewis sends out his A-team to examine how far further he is up the Marias River than the previous year finds out it's about six miles and then continues on another 20 or so. For Ordway, he's just below the Great Falls area at this point. He's camped on the, below the Smith River. Clark, will make this canoe camp. His first task, he sends John Shields and Nathaniel Pryor out. Would you go out and see if you can find any better trees anywhere down the river? 12 miles later, they come back with nothing, so this becomes canoe camp. And the only way to make this work is to build two long, skinny canoes, 28 feet long and only two feet wide, and then strap them together somehow to make kind of a catamaran. Uh, so that's happening at this point. And Lewis continues along the Marias and he picks up three more plants. What's interesting here, if you look at these plants, I think you recognize he's moved out of that beautiful alpine environment he was in and into something that's a lot more arid and prairie like. The 
the 21st, Lewis continues to the west, and late in the day he comes up with a new a, a stream coming in from the north. He turns up that and recognizes this is not looking good. He was aiming for the 50th parallel. This yellow line across the top is the 49th parallel, and you can see that his route is taking him far more west than it is north, and so he's obviously not getting where he wants to go. For Clark, this becomes horses part three. When Clark wakes up in the morning this day, 24 of his 50 horses are gone. And he promptly sends men out in every direction. Charbonne goes upstream, Shannon goes downstream, Bratton goes out into the prairie north of the camp, and they all come back completely empty. Meanwhile, the canoe construction continues on. This is the day that the portage begins. Ordway and Gas have got things put together. The carts are done. They spent the previous evening finishing up the harnesses and trying them out on the horses. Now, considering that these horses have certainly never seen a harness like this before and been teamed up, you might be surprised at what happens next. Uh, and be because the route looks so confusing, I'm going to just do this one day at a time. But when they wake up in the morning, it's horses part three because there are no horses. They all left. <laughs> so the men start hauling the canoes across the prairie. We don't know how far, but this is serious uphill work. And they get somewhere out in the prairie and they simply crash and burn for the day. They spend the night huddled around fires made from buffalo dung trying to smudge the mosquitoes away. He's trying to make this camping sound romantic, you know. <laughs> okay. The 22nd, this is the day that Lewis reaches Camp Disappointment. This is kind of what the area looks like, and all the experts tend to agree it was right in this area. There's a bluff right by the camp. If you climb up on top, it's real easy to see a beautiful range of mountains off in the distance. That's actually the eastern edge of Glacier National Park. Uh, you can even see going to the Sun Mountain from up there. And so this is where Lewis is going to stay. This is going to become Camp Disappointment for a couple of reasons. Obviously, he's a long ways away from his goal. Uh, disappointing in that way. And the stream he's been following is turning to the southwest, which says there's no point to go any further. It's also going to be disappointing because he's going to spend three days trying to get some celestial reeds. And he's going to fail on all three days because... The beautiful view he has like this the first day he gets there is not repeated for the rest of the time he stays. The clouds come in and he's socked in. For Clark, he's not given up on those horses. On this day, Pryor and Charbonneau go almost back to the previous campsite. They find nothing when they get back. Pryor goes out into the rougher land north of camp and again can find nothing. Uh, meanwhile, the canoes continue to be built. For the portagers, first thing is to find the horses, which they do almost all the way at the Great Falls. The horses have made 10 miles in getting away from those harnesses. Uh, they then bring them back, hitch them up, and they proceed across the prairie where one of the axle trees break. They have to go all the way back to the upper portage camp to get timber adequate to repair it. So they drop the canoes off, drag the carts back, get the timber, load up two more canoes, and take off and make it out into the prairie, again, camping somewhere. This is the day I say they camped in my backyard. I'm not sure, but you can't prove me wrong. Okay, the 23rd, Lewis sends Druilliard out to look around. Druilliard says, yes, that stream goes off to the southwest. And, oh, there's a lot of Indian sign around here. Lewis says, maybe I should go back the same way I came and be safe. Uh, meanwhile, Clark sends out men to explore again. This time it's Labiche. And uh, prior, once again, Labiche finds the trail where the horses have departed. Prior finds 
a wet moccasin, which seems to be quite fresh, which suggests that there are opportunists lurking nearby. For the portage, they make it to Willow Run with two canoes. It's a step in the right direction. The 24th, we'll go to the horses first. Uh, on this day, the canoes are finished, they're loaded. Pryor takes the horses along the north shore of the Yellowstone River. Clark takes the canoes, and after they find a good crossing place uh, somewhere just about south of Billings, Montana, where Pryor takes the horses off up into the hills, and away he goes. Now, from this point on, when you see Pryor on the map, it's entirely speculation on my part, because Pryor was supposed to keep a journal and probably he did because he was, seems like a kind of guy who would, but we don't have it. It's gone. So I'm guesstimating everything here. Uh, they will make it to a prior creek and work their way through that on some muddy ground. Clark will camp somewhere east, just, just east of Billings. The portage, all the way back, pick up some more canoes, and they get the two more canoes all the way back to Willow Run. So they've got kind of a nice cache of canoes at Willow Run now. They're well on the way, and some of the men take one of the canoes all the way to the mouth of Portage Creek. So they've got one canoe ready to go. The next day, Lewis is still up at Camp Disappointment. He sends Drouillard and Field out again. They go all the way to the main stream, to the day's two medicine, find more Indian sign, and they find a deer so that the men can finally eat. They've been eating pretty much nothing for the last several days uh, because of where they've camped. Clark has an interesting day. He finds a funny rock on the side of the river. Uh, he stops, he climbs up on top, looks at the view, and then takes the time to autograph it and names it Pompey's Tower after the little boy, uh, today's Pompey's Pillar. Prior, we don't know, but we think he's camped somewhere near Hardin, Montana, roughly parallel to Lewis and quite a ways south of him at this point. And as for the portage, they get all the canoes to the mouth of Portage Creek by this point. They're probably placed right down in here. Uh, it looks like a nasty bluff, but there's actually a kind of a nice grade behind it for you to get the canoes into the river. Ordway camps under a canoe that night because it's raining so hard, so he has, keeps the rain off the top and sleeps in a puddle of mud instead. Uh, but they're one canoe short of being done. The 26th, horses, parts four and five. On this day, Lewis will not follow his own advice and head down to the river. And what we get is that somewhere along there, he is working along these bluffs right in the foreground. George Drouillard is hunting on the river bottom down below, and somewhere in between them, Clark sees a herd of 30 horses and about eight men. And he recognizes he's got himself in a bind. What do you do? Uh, you run away, the horses aren't in good enough shape to escape. If you run away, you leave Drouillard to his fate. So Lewis, being Lewis, just promptly advances towards the Indians and says, Hi, how are you? Let's camp together, and we'll try and make the best of what could be a dangerous situation. Uh, there's three different places where they might have camped, but the one that I'm showing here is one that seems to be the most uh, accepted one. Uh, when it was found by Larry Epstein and his Boy Scouts in the 60s, there were three cottonwood trees there. There's one remaining today, and if this is the right place, they probably camped right by that cottonwood tree uh, for the evening. And Lewis tells them he's planning to go to the Marias, and they should come and accompany him, and gives them a lot of information that maybe, if he'd known how things were going to turn out, he would have kept to himself. Uh, Clark makes it to the mouth of the Bighorn River early enough. He takes a seven-mile hike up the river and, of course, seven miles back before he camps at the mouth. For Pryor, this is really a bad day. He wakes up in the morning, and his 26 horses have been reduced to zero. 
So now he's out in the middle of the prairie with no horses. They do some looking. They can't find him. So he and his men walk back to the Yellowstone River, coming out right near Pompey's Pillar. And they are, this is the quintessential up the creek without a paddle people because Clark is 50 miles away and heading away from them. They have no means to get there. What do you do? And the plan they come up with is we'll make a couple of bull boats. We've seen the Mandans and Hedots has used the bull boats. And they will build, over the next day or two, a couple of bull boats, put two men in each with two rifles in each and some powder in each so that if they spill, there's still a chance they can feed themselves. And they're going to try and chase Clark, which is going to be an interesting challenge. Okay, for the portage, they go back and pick up the last canoe. Coulter and Pot start ferrying the canoes down to the White Pirogue. By the end of the day, the entire portage is completed. Six days and they're done. And they're ready to divide things up and take off the following morning. On that morning, Lewis wakes up to hearing Drouillard shout, damn you, let go of my gun. And a melee breaks out. The Indian gentlemen have decided to try and liberate the, Lewis's men's firearms. And in the course of collecting them back again, Reuben Field stabs and kills a man. Uh, then a second melee breaks out because then they try to make off with the horses. Lewis shoots somebody, possibly, probably, fatally, probably, if this is right, in about this area right here. And then the Indians head off to the west. Lewis quickly collects what baggage they've left behind and burns it all. He collects seven horses. Uh, his horse was stolen, so he liberates one of his up for himself, and they will head off behind this bluff. There's a pretty nice pass up to the top, and they will take off on a truly epic ride. Uh, By the end of the day, by my estimations, he's 91 miles away from where he started. Now, it sounds ferocious, but keep in mind, this all happened just about daybreak, and they ride until 2 in the morning. So you're actually only traveling about 5 miles an hour. That's still a long time to sit a horse, and that's a long time for a poor horse to have to carry you. Uh, if we look at this and kind of trace it out real quickly, Here's Lewis making his route along the Marias up to Camp Disappointment, back to the fight site, and then back. At the same time, Ordway and Gas depart. Gas takes the four horses and goes up to the Tansy to hunt while he, to get meat while they wait for Lewis. Ordway, somewhat later in the day, takes off with all of the canoes and the pirogue. By the end of the night, if my calculations are right, the three parties are camped within eight miles of each other. And what's stunning about this is this is an area that's bigger than the state of Connecticut. And they're that close to right on top of each other. Okay. The following day, uh, Clark continues on through what amounts to essentially a kind of prairie Eden, finding all kinds of animals, and he collects a plant this day. For Lewis, it's another kind of miraculous day. By the end of the, uh, he takes off early, he can't, he hears gunshots, he follows them to the river, and there he finds Ordway's men in the canoes. He loads up as quickly as he can, hops in the boats, abandons his horses, and takes the canoes to the mouth of the Marias. Eventually, Gass and Willard show up. All the horses are abandoned. The canoes are reloaded. The, white, the red pirogue is stripped of its hardware. And their decision is, we will keep on moving. And so they go a little bit further downstream and camp on the south side of the river. By this point, Lewis is literally 100 miles by air away from the fight site, and he's made 140 miles in two days, which is kind of incredible. 
Okay? And on that, on that day as well, I think Pryor probably got back into the river. The following day, Lewis heads into the White Cliffs area, harvesting more mountain sheep along the way. Uh, on the 30th, he writes in the journals, he's making seven miles an hour with the canoes. That sounds startling, but when you look at what happened later on, this is kind of average. Lee and I canoed the Missouri a few years ago, and we made seven miles an hour for about Oh, at least a couple hundred yards. <laughs> and that was in a fiberglass canoe. These guys are working way harder than we could do. <laughs> it was amazing. Uh, more bighorn sheep are collected. Pryor's going to plot along behind. Lewis has met the Tongue River, and this day he meets the Powder River and is held up by shoals, but he's still making good progress charting the Yellowstone. And as I'm running short on time here to kind of speed up the process, for Lewis, I think he pretty much has decided this is it. He's now in a race to get to the mouth of the Yellowstone as soon as possible because his mission, such as it was, is completed. And so he's going to be moving, by and large, rapidly. So we can kind of go through this, these next steps pretty quickly indeed. Uh, so on the 31st, uh, Lewis harvests more mountain sheep. He also kills 15 elk that were swimming the river and skins them just for their hides so he's got tarps because it's raining every day. Uh, Clark mentions being miserable and wet this day because they've got no cover in the canoe whatsoever, but he still makes another 45 miles or so. Pryor prods along behind. Pryor has to make about 35 miles a day to catch up uh, with Clark in the time that he did. August 1st, this is William Clark's birthday. So William Clark's birthday, the buffalo stage a surprise for him, and they block the entire Yellowstone River, so he has to wait 75 minutes before the herd has passed, and he can go on his way. Lewis will make it past the mouth of the mussel shell, and the weather starts to clear, so he decides to stop and try and dry out some of his hides before he loses them. On the second, Clark continues on again. More buffalo herds crossing the river, but he's able to not have to avoid them. Clark, or Lewis stays in place. John Coulter and John Collins go out to hunt, as do the Field brothers as well. Pryor plods along behind. This is kind of the standard litany for poor Pryor. On the third, you can see where they are. Lewis takes off again, ready to go, and has a 60-plus mile day on the river that day. Uh, he passes Coulter and Collins, and they're not there. They holler for them. They get no response. They continue on. By the end of the day, at least as Coulter and Collins tell the story later, they thought they were ahead of the captain, and they're waiting for him to catch up, but in truth, they're probably five or ten miles behind. Uh, Clark reaches the mouth of the Yellowstone. Uh, he's going to camp there and wait for Lewis. That's the plan. The fourth, Lewis has another huge day, and Coulter and Collins wait for him to catch up, so now they're probably more than 60 miles behind, maybe 70 miles behind. Uh, interesting event. Ordway and Willard are out hunting. Willard gets caught in a snag and swept right out of his canoe and he will spend a couple hours in the river because Ordway can't rescue him. He finally floats himself out by building a raft in the middle of the snag and floating free with it to get back to camp. Luckily they're not too far from where Lewis had camped for the night. Clark moves his camp. Too many mosquitoes. Ordway plods along. August 5th, Lewis waits half the day for Coulter and Collins. They don't show up, so he takes off. Coulter and Collins are still waiting for the captain, so they don't go very far. And so now they're probably more than 100 miles behind. Clark moves his camp again because of mosquitoes. 
on the 6th, Lewis makes, has another 60 plus mile day and now it's Clark killing bighorn sheep trying to collect specimens. And on this day, finally Coulter and Collins take off, but they probably stay about 100 miles behind as well. So we get down to the end here. I call it playing catch up. You can see what kind of a mess it gets up in this part right here. The camp sites get closer and closer together as they gradually close the gap. So we're going to switch to a different map for this. So on the 7th, this is about what it looks like. Pryor is maybe 25 miles behind Clark at this point. Lewis is still not on the page, but he's going to have a huge day this day, almost 80 miles. He pushes hard to get to the mouth of the Yellowstone, finds no Clark, but does find a note, takes off, goes to Clark's first camp sign, finds no Clark, but he does find the remains of George Gibson's uh, clats up hat that Lewis had purchased the year before that fell in a fire and continues on beyond that. The eighth, Lewis continues on a short distance. The boats, two of the boats have sprung leaks and so he stops to repair them. He finds a nice beach where that'll work. Early in the morning, Pryor shows up in Clark's camp. Now this has to be a monumental shock and not a good one either for Clark. This guy's supposed to have 24 horses or 26 horses, maybe 200 miles away. And here he is floating into camp in a couple of leather canoes. And when he hears the story, Clark says to him, where are the papers that I sent with you? He'd given him a letter to Hugh Haney. And Pryor says, oh, I left that back at the last, last campsite. Clark says, go get it. <laughs> now, keep in mind, without the horses, the letter is completely irrelevant. So I kind of think that the redhead showed his nature on this particular day because Pryor now walks about 10 miles back to the last campsite and 10 miles back again, and he has another 30-mile day, and Clark has some time to cool off. Clark doesn't move that day waiting for Pryor to return. On the ninth, Clark has a pretty healthy day, but he kills the biggest uh, bull elk he's ever encountered, and so he stops to jerk the meat. Lewis stays put. Coulter and Collins are finally on the, the scene, and things are closing up. On the 10th, kind of a neat day, uh, Lewis takes off late in the day, but he gets far enough that Coulter and Collins don't catch him this day, Clark, while he's waiting for the meat to be jerked, takes the time to go out and collect some more plants. One of them is the white milkwort. The other one I'll talk about in just a moment is the pin cherry. The 11th. This is where we stand as the day begins. Lewis decides he wants a celestial reed at noon at the Burnt Hills. So he has the men paddle like crazy. They still arrive at the Burnt Hills at 1220, which is 20 minutes too late for his read. So he says, well, there's some elk on the north side. So he sends the hunters in the canoes off to the north side to get the elk. And then he sees some elk on the south side. So he takes the pirogue. And this is the day he goes hunting with the blind guy. And the result is uh, Lewis is shot. After his, the assessment is made that it was not an Indian attack, that Cruzat just made a mistake, uh, Gas and Lewis tend to his wounds. He hops back in the boat and makes another 20 miles or so. Another 60 mile day for Lewis this day. Coulter and Collins probably lose ground because Lewis went so far. Clark moves downstream, but he stops because he meets two, col two trappers, Joseph Dixon and Forrest Hancock, and stops to visit with them. On the 12th, things finally will come together. Lewis takes off, he meets the trappers this day, and he stops to spend 90 minutes or so with them. And while this is going on, Coulter and Collins finally catch up. Now for Coulter and Collins, this means they have been on their own for 380 miles. Uh, and Lewis dismisses it in the journal, but I would like to point out that when they show up, they have in their canoe 
31 beaver pelts, and at two bucks a piece, which is good 18.6 money for a beaver pelt, that would be one year's salary for an army private, or six months salary for each of them for 11 days work. Uh, not that they were indulging themselves, possibly. Uh, so while they catch up, Clark leaves, but George Shannon surprisingly leaves a tomahawk behind. Clark says, go get it. <laughs> so he waits, and while he waits, he finds that somebody's punched a hole in one of the bull boats. So he stops to repair the bull boats while he's waiting for Shannon. And then, before the day is done, Lewis finally shows up, and the group is finally reunited. For the bull boats, Pryor and his men took those bull boats 400 miles. And interestingly, one of the guys in the group was Hugh Hall, who wanted to be with Pryor on a horse because he couldn't swim. He's just spent 400 miles with the thickness of a buffalo skin between him and eternity. Uh, but the bull boats actually handled the river better than the canoes did. And so then the canoes, have, or the bull boats, have been used 50 more miles for Clark before they are abandoned, which I would never have thought a bull boat would last that long in the river, but it's pretty amazing. They then continue on a few more miles, and on this day, Lewis makes his last entry in his journals, and he, his last thing he writes about is this singular cherry, the pin cherry. What's cool about this is that if you read about this in the herbarium of Gary Moulton, this is mislabeled as a choke cherry. Lewis and Clark knew it wasn't a choke cherry. This was a different kind of plant. Frederick Persch, the botanist hired by Lewis to do the herbarium, didn't make the distinction. So the captains are that good that they can recognize the difference that the trained botanist could not. I think that's kind of cool. So the following day, it's a huge day, about 80 miles with the whole group together. By the end of the day, they're seeing native people along the shores um, pretty frequently. The following day, it's a short day, uh, down to returning back to the Hidatsa and Mandan villages. And at this point, Clark begins a frantic two and a half days of negotiation. So let's get to the last items on the list and we'll be done here. Hopefully not too late. Uh, Clark has lost out on the horses, but he still has a chance for some diplomacy. So he will ask the different leaders of the Hidatsa and Mandan villages to join him. Coulter asked permission to leave and go back upriver. As long as he doesn't take anybody with him, the captains say, go for it. The men are busy making leather clothing this day because they expect that there's, they're, they're going to be busy from this point on. And the native people are kind enough to deliver all kinds of vegetables so they have a dietary break for the next few days at least. The following day, Clark fires off the swivel gun and then gives it to Laborn, the leader of the Hidatsas, hoping to persuade him with the swivel gun, maybe to follow along. Late in the day, Sheheke uh, of the Mandans agrees to go as long as he can take his family and as long as Rene Jusome and his family will accompany him on the trip. Uh, the captains, of course, agree. On the 17th, the Charbonneau family leaves the expedition. Toussaint Charbonneau would have gone to Washington if LeBourne had chosen to go along, but since the, he doesn't, they don't need Charbonneau as a translator. Charbonneau is paid $500.33 and one-third cents for his labors, and he's given the blacksmithing tools uh, as part of the compensation as well, which I think might explain what happened to the iron frame boat that was left in the Great Falls. Coulter departs to the west. The expedition will depart with a stop at the burned out remains of Fort Mandan, and then they will continue on downstream. From this point on, I think it's safe to say the expedition is essentially over. Now they just are on their way home. Maybe five more plants are collected. It's not exactly clear. 
they will average 38 miles a day, occasionally hitting 60. It takes them 37 days to reach St. Louis, which is a better than 135 miles, 135 days the previous two years ago to get upstream. So they're moving basically four times as fast. So what do the numbers show us? In terms of distance covered, you can see that each of the captains covered about 1,000 miles or so. What I think is interesting is that without captain supervision, uh, the sergeants and the enlisted men on their own covered another 2,000 miles as well, which gives you an enormous amount of information from different men going over territory at different times in different conditions. And if you look at that list that I gave you at the beginning, how well did they do in achieving some of their goals? They explored the shortcut road to the buffalo. They will consider that the best route. The Yellowstone River is charted. They've recovered their caches. They've transported their canoes. They've explored the Marias. They've added new plants and animal specimens. As you can see, 34 more plants have been added to the herbarium. And they have transported the horses as well, just not necessarily to where they intended. <laughs> so in conclusion, was it worth it? And I'm going to argue, I think it was. This exploration adds tremendously to William Clark's map. During 1806, more than two-thirds of the plants in the herbarium were collected uh, because most everything they collected in the summer of 1805 was destroyed in the caches. So without the collecting at this point, they wouldn't have most of the herbarium. Uh, the duplicates are critical because if you get that blue flax this year, you didn't have it from last year, you still got it. Two new continental uh, divide passes have been explored, both of them nice Indian roads and both of them far better than their troubles of 185. Uh, they have determined the most practical water route to the Pacific, it just isn't the best route to the Pacific as later history will show us. They've brought back more animal specimens. The Yellowstone is going to be a great highway for the fur trade industry that will develop in the next few years carefully charted out by William Clark. With Sheheke, they have at least some small success with their Indian diplomacy. And I think you could even argue that Camp Disappointment, if it was disappointing, at least it makes it pretty palatable when you have to say, we're gonna divide Canada and the United States someplace, the 49th parallel seems like not a bad deal. And so on that, I will rest my case.